She said, okay, and she went with him. That's the last time she was seen. The nature of Janice Ott's disappearance would provide an insight into how Bundy had abducted at least seven young women without so far drawing attention to himself. What Bundy did seemed to me to be incredibly clever. He would wear casts on his arm. He'd pretend to be injured in some way and ask for help. Now, of course, what this is doing is simply creating access. Once he has that access, he uses the opportunity that that access gives him to facilitate the kill. But the extraordinary events of the hot July day would not end with the disappearance of Janice Ott. Only hours later, as 40,000 people reveled in the sunshine, Bundy was back and roaming freely amongst them. A little later in the afternoon, Denise Nasland was there with her boyfriend and another couple. And she had to go to the restroom, and it's kind of a concrete um, little box sitting off by itself. She went, never came back. Bundy had abducted two young women from the same busy location on the same day in broad daylight. The psychological gain that he got from the first murder wasn't enough to sustain him. He needed more. Serial killing starts as a consequence of a fantasy. The fantasy becomes refined over time. So one ultimately wasn't enough. The fantasy demanded that two were necessary. Using helicopters and dogs, the police began a massive search of some 400 acres around Lake Sammamish Park. Not a trace was found. The girls had simply disappeared. I recall her boyfriend who'd been at the park with her that day. I remember him being there while during the search and leaning on his car and, and just crying, just sobbing that it was, you know, fearing the worst. But Bundy's audacity had betrayed him. The park was so busy that day that it was easy for them to put together some profiles that quickly identified this person that they identified as Ted. People at the park heard him introduce himself to, to Janice Ott and saw her leave with him. Within that week, they had a composite sketch of uh, uh, the man that they believed uh, who turned out to be Ted Bundy. When I look back on that day now, I don't remember it as, as innocent as it was. Despite having a name and description for the suspect, no one who knew him would connect the charismatic young Ted Bundy with the man who'd now abducted at least eight women. My friend and myself commented when, when it came up that summer that, uh, that there was a clue, somebody by the name of Ted that had a Volkswagen. And we commented and, and joked that, you know, maybe it's Ted because he's never here. But of course, that, that was really something we didn't consider because of his characteristics. You, you would never imagine that he would be involved in something like that. If serial killers came with horns on their heads, we could avoid them. Unfortunately, serial killers are often very charming, very seducing. So we shouldn't imagine somehow serial killers are Hollywood devils, because actually it's the banality of evil that we're dealing with in serial killers. By mid-September 1974, Bundy was on the move. He headed to Salt Lake City, where he'd enrolled at the University of Utah to study law. He went to Utah and girls started disappearing 
in Salt Lake City suburbs around um, there, much in the same way that um, girls had been disappearing in, um, in Washington State. Over the next three months, four young girls were discovered sexually assaulted and murdered. Bundy was seemingly unstoppable. It was as well planned as, as um, you know, a military action. Every time he, he selected a murder to do, he had procedures that he followed. He had certain tools that he brought with him. He had everything laid out completely, and he thought through all this stuff. He did very well at getting away and avoiding being arrested and, and avoiding law enforcement. He was a master predator. But in November 1974, Bundy made his first major mistake. He attempted to kidnap a young woman named, named Carol Durange in Salt Lake City. Uh, alleged to her that he was a police officer, that there had been an attempt to steal her car. And uh, when they couldn't get into a back door of a mall where he said it was a police substation, he took her over to his Volkswagen and attempted to drive away with her. She figured something was happening when he tried to, to handcuff her, jumped out of the car of the moving vehicle and was able to escape. Carol Deronch had escaped, but her attacker was still on the loose. Over the next seven months, six more young women were abducted in Utah and neighboring Colorado. But on August the 16th, Bundy's luck finally ran out. An off-duty Utah State police officer saw him prowling around a neighborhood in the Volkswagen, stopped him, they charged him with possession of burglary tools, were able to use his photograph in a photographic lineup, and Carol Durange was able to pick him out. Ted Bundy had been caught. He was charged and convicted of the kidnapping of Carol Durange and sentenced to between 1 and 15 years. But Ted Bundy was about to pull off an extraordinary feat that would see him free again to kill at will. In 1977, Ted Bundy had been convicted for the attempted kidnapping of Carol Durant in Utah. Police were now convinced Bundy was a serial killer and moved him to Colorado to face charges for the abduction and murder of 24-year-old Karen Campbell in Snowmass. Bundy was to be tried in Aspen. If convicted, he would face the rest of his life behind bars. But Ted Bundy had other plans. He petitioned the courts to allow him to defend himself, and by doing so, required that they would take him out of the setting of, as a normal inmate and put him into, say, the law library or places that weren't as secure as what his cell might be. On June the 7th, 1977, during a recess in the case, Bundy asked to be allowed access to legal research material. He was acting as own counsel. He was working in the law library in the courthouse. He jumped out the window and fled. Bundy had outwitted his captors and was free. He blended into the crowds on the busy Aspen streets and headed for the surrounding mountains. Bundy would interpret that as his ability to overcome the criminal justice system. He would see himself as cleverer than all those police officers, all those detectives who allowed him access to the library so that he could do research for his upcoming court case. For the next eight days, Bundy hid in the wilderness, sheltering in disused cabins and stealing food from campers, while embarrassed law enforcement frantically searched for him. There is a self-centeredness about serial killers where they see themselves as the most clever, as the most talented, the most intelligent, because the whole world revolves around them. After days in the wild, Bundy audaciously walked back into Aspen and stole a car. 
but his luck was about to run out. He had approached a police roadblock and was, was observed. They went back when he U-turned, went back and chased him down, placed him under arrest. Bundy was returned to Garfield County Jail in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Security was raised, and authorities were confident they had the prisoner safely interred. Again, Bundy had other ideas. He was always thinking. You had to keep that in mind when you dealt with him. On December the 30th, 1977, Ted Bundy made his move. He lost weight. He, he was able to move aside a, uh, a neon light fixture, slid up through the ceiling, went over to the, the ceiling of, uh, of a closet into the, the jailer's home, and dropped in there. By the time his jailers discovered he was gone, Bundy was already a thousand miles away in Chicago. After spending New Year's Eve in a bar in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Bundy took a bus to Tallahassee in Florida. With a new identity, he rented a room in the Oaks Lodging House in the heart of the Florida State University student area. After 18 months of imprisonment, Bundy's scheming had paid off. He'd made fools of the law and was finally free. But for Ted Bundy, it wasn't enough. Serial killers love being at the heart of the drama that's unfolding around them. When Bundy moved to Florida, he no longer had the status that he was able to follow vicariously in the print or broadcast media, as he would have been able to do in Utah and Colorado or Washington. He was a nobody again, rather than a somebody. And that's what Bundy ultimately wanted to be. So he has to do something again to gain the attention that he craves so he can demonstrate his gross form of power over the culture that he abhors. In the early hours of January the 14th, 1978, just one week after arriving in Tallahassee, Ted Bundy struck again. About three o'clock in the morning, a young woman named Nita Neary was returning to her sorority house. She entered the downstairs. Uh, she saw a, a man run out of the house, carrying what appeared to be um, a stick in his hand. She went upstairs and, and awoke the, the sorority president when Karen Chandler walked out of her room. They turned to Karen and said, did you see and realize that the Karen was bleeding? Jim Sewell was a sergeant and assistant to the chief of police when his phone rang that night. The dispatcher called and said, Sarge, we've got two dead and two dying. Sewell was the first plainclothes officer on the scene. When I got to the house, upstairs, I went into Bowman's room. Margaret Bowman had been strangled and was dead upon review by our officers. A nylon stocking was tied tightly around Margaret Bowman's neck. She'd been clubbed with a branch, so hard that her skull had been shattered. It was everything you'd think about a beating victim, what, what she would say. Across the hall, another victim was discovered. Lisa Levy, she had also been, been beaten and appeared to be strangled. 20-year-old Lisa Levy was in bed, dead lying on her side, the covers pulled up over her shoulders. She'd been sexually assaulted with an object. The attack had been savage. Lisa had also been bitten uh, on, the, on the breast and on the buttocks. Two more girls, Karen Chandler and Kathy Kleiner, had also been bludgeoned. They only just survived the brutal attack. All that, that built-up the built feeling